So I'll start off by just welcoming you all and thank you for coming. Um, and I'm going to introduce uh, the adults that we have here and also Yasmin. So um, we have John Ray Hasty, who is the CEO of Pathfinders, um, who lives in Reading with his um, husband in his own flat. Then we've got Mark Chapman, who lives in Edinburgh. Edinburgh, thank you. Um, you said that, thank you very much. Um, um, in his own, is it a flat? Uh, yeah, kind of. Um, who is a founding a member of... A <laughs> okay, who is a founding member of Pathfinders. Yeah. Then we have Steve, who lives in Leeds in his own bungalow, um, who I know through... Oh, so do I. And, um, <laughs> and we have Ryan O'Leary, who lives in Hampshire in his own flat, but he's soon to be moving. We might hear a bit more about that later. Um, who has a degree in animation. And John Ashby, who lives over in Coventry in his own bungalow, who told me he didn't do anything today, but then we found out he's studying level three in graphic design. That he'd forgotten about. <laughs> As you do. <laughs> and we you also have <laughs> Yasmin. Do you want to introduce yourself, Yasmin? Um, hi, so I'm Yasmin, and um, I've actually known both Mark and John since the beginning of um, it was DMD Pathfinders when it first started, and I just remember being in a room with both of them and. I asked some questions and they were just brimming with ideas. And from then, of course, they it started small. Uh, I think with a, I think John, you reminded me with a Facebook page or something. And then I, um, and then it's grown into you know the amazing organisation that it is today. And I suppose I've sort of over time I've worked alongside both John and Mark and a number of other people, um, just supporting projects and ideas and my job basically is to ask questions and um, people can hear themselves say things they might not even have known they were thinking but uh, helping them to sort of build and develop the projects and things that they want. Thank you and I, I suppose I should introduce myself and then you forgot myself sorry. Um, so I'm Kath, I'm working as the engagement officer for Pathfinders Neuromuscular Alliance and specifically at the moment working on a project with the Duchenne community. So um, the way we're going to try and hold tonight is it's meant to be a bit informal. So if you have a question, please put your hand up with the little icon or if you want, if you can't find that and you want to use your physical hand, put that in the air, that's fine as well. Um, but don't feel like you've got to just sit and listen. Please. It's meant to be interactive. Um, so we are going to, first of all, ask some questions to get it going me and Yasmin between us for the first probably 15 or so minutes. And then after that, we're gonna open the floor to questions from you all. We hope you've got some that you've come with. Um, and that's gonna be followed at the, at the end by a little bit about a new project that I'm working on with a little video from somebody that had something to say who couldn't be here today. And then we'll finish off with letting you know what's gonna happen post this meeting. We should, all, we should be finished up by about eight o'clock. Do you want to start, Yasmin? Yeah, so, well, Mark, is it all, all right if I sort of do a little mini interview with you for a few minutes? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, this whole thing is about transitioning into adulthood, and I think we can all agree that you are definitely have transitioned into adulthood, Mark. <laughs> um, and, uh, I mean, basically, you've done a lot of amazing and interesting things. Yeah. Uh, I know that you're, uh, well, you're a legendary traveller, um, I just wanted to ask you about maybe, you know, something that, that you enjoy doing. So it may be travel, but it may be something else. Yeah, well, travel is a good part of it. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, I've not been able to do that for a while. But... Sorry, say that again? I've not, even, I've not been able to do it for a while. No, it's, uh, it, <laughs> we have all had to sort of curtail our travel um, desires haven't we yeah, but when yeah. you are able to travel um mark i mean what do you enjoy most about it what is it about traveling that really appeals to you i'm just being something else and 
just learning about that place or mm-hmm. just being in a different culture or nice. Yeah. It's seeing somewhere different, yeah. maybe learning about somewhere different, learning about different cultures or whatever. Yeah. Um now obviously and just meeting other people as well. And meeting other people, yeah, and lots of different yeah. sorts of people, I guess. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things I'd like to ask you is, um, you know, to be able to travel, there are lots of things that you have to be able to do in order to move oh, yes. yourself from where you are now in Edinburgh to wherever it is. Yes, a lot of logistical um, binding. So, I mean, if I just asked you maybe to pick on two or three key things that you have to do in order to be able to do your travelling. It's really just working out the logistics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the main one is getting the staff to go with you. Right, okay. And, and how it will pay for that. Mm-hmm. Because it won't always be covered by your independent living funding. Um, no. It depends, really. Okay. So there's logistics. It's about... Um, having staff to go with you and then there's all the round the edge things about you know how they'll get paid which fund and and whatever yeah 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 um what else give me one other thing that you have to to be able to do in order to be able to do the traveling that you enjoy and well for flying for example and you have to have all the information ready Uh ah yeah because there's certain things you have to put in place right like making sure the airline will carry your equipment. Right. And um, things like that. Uh-huh. Um, so really you have to be able to sort of think about all the things in advance, about all the things that you need to have ready. Yes, and you have to do that yeah. in advance. So. Mm-hmm. Now, in order to be able to do all this logistics, the planning, the thinking, yeah. the... Uh, forward, um, you know, preventing of things happening or create, making them happen, yeah. Just what skills do you have to be able to have as an adult now in order to be able to do all those logistics? Um, confidence, resilience. Mm-hmm. Resilience. Um, and being prepared for things to go wrong. Oh, okay. Sure. So um, just having, just let's take confidence because that's a really yeah. important one. Um, what what difference does it make having having confidence? What difference does that make to how you go about things? It's better. It makes it easier to explore where to go because not just on the we're not saying you find it on the internet, but it's mm-hmm. it's also being able to phone places and. Okay. I speak to people, I speak to other people mm-hmm. to get a bit of their experience if you're sure. maybe going somewhere that you know somebody else has been. Yep. Ah, okay. That's nice. So linking with other people, being able to phone, and I guess have, being able to ask the questions that you need to ask. Yes, that's right. Uh-huh. And you know when you have to make decisions. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm living I'm just knowing, knowing that sometimes you have to be a bit pushy. Ah, okay. Like if you're dealing with an airline and you're being, uh-huh. yeah, a bit difficult, and you have to be a bit mm. pushy. And when you say being a bit or a pushy, ferry company or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. So if you don't get the answer that you want immediately or the information you need or whatever, you have to be able to come back at yeah. it. Uh-huh. Now, thinking back to when you were younger, okay, so when you were not quite transitioned into adulthood, right. um, can you think of maybe one of the skills or the important things that your parents or people you were involved with when you were younger, a skill or something that they that they they taught you, or, or something they did that really helped you now be the sort of confident, resilient, being able to plan adult that you are. It's that. 
It's a bit of fainting at the beginning. I'm having to fight for what you're determined to achieve, I suppose. Mm. And a bit of that came from a group of friends at school, as well as mm -hmm. my parents being a bit pushy. Mm. Um, and I was involved in that. Um, right. Process because you knew what I wanted. To. Uh huh. So learning from friends and also from your parents about the needing to be pushy and yeah. you seeing them do it, but also them asking you what you wanted. So you were involved in yeah. also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so over time, that yeah. helped us to build your sort of confidence and resilience that's useful to you now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. And um, part okay. of that was dealing with professionals. Because sometimes they maybe had no tea that was a bit difficult and was asked just to mm -hmm. go away and find another one. But it's, it's wondering also that. Um, mm. So what sometimes the experts or professionals won't have the answer. Okay. I, 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 I can see what you want to do. Uh-huh. So if I've understood you right, Mark, sort of also going at things in different ways. If this if this isn't the answer here, yes. is it finding a different way round? Yes, yeah, a bit of very box thinking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a bit of bolshiness can go a long way sometimes, can't it? <laughs> In situations. Yes, I think so. So what's it then? So, you know, hopefully going to be, you know, parents are going to, to be watching this. So what tip would you give to parents now who are supporting or will be supporting their child, their young person into adulthood? If you had to, if you could impart a tip yeah, from where you are to, now. Um, not to hold back, really. Um, to try and understand what can be achieved. Mm. Um, it's not always easy. Um, being prepared for a bit of battle, really. Mm. And fighting, but to really evolve... Uh, the young person in that process too. Mm. Um, it can seem very daunting at first. Um, I'm not going to be a step by step approach. Mm. So, in a way, it's like a, a skill that, that, that needs practicing. Oh, yes, yeah, so it's easy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm going to stop it there, not because you haven't got a million other interesting things to say, but no, just so um, Kath has a, a chance to ask some of the other people. Thank you. Thank you very much, okay. Mark, um, for, um, for your contributions. I'm sure we're going to hear from you a bit later in it anyway, Mark. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, it was really interesting. Thank you ever so much, because some of the things that you were saying, um, I know that I've spoken to Ryan and John Ashby and Steve about some very similar things. And I, I think it's Steve, I wanted to ask you, I think it was you that mentioned to me about, um, when I asked about where you got your confidence from, um, that you mentioned about a birthday card, is that correct? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, basically my friend was ill and um, I went to get a card. But I went to my mum Oh, a card. Um, can you get me a card? And she goes, no, go get it yourself. So I went down to the shop, got it, and then basically that's helped in her confidence. Mm -hmm. So she didn't treat you any differently to your brothers? No, not at all. 
Um, and also, um, Ryan, I know that um, I've spoken to you before about um, how much involvement in your transition your mum had. Yeah. So could you tell me, could you tell me a little bit about that, about how she's, how much involvement she had at the beginning when you went off to um, residential college and how much involvement in your supporting your independent living she has now, now that you're living independently in your own flat? And she just tried to see me as a, just a normal child at first and not treat me and my brother any differently. So we were always treated the same, had the same pocket money, same everything. So my they just treated me normally, really. And that's why, I'm, and then my mum, so I, I said to mum that I didn't think that I could go to a mainstream college. I just thought it would be too much for me. And then she tried everything to get me into law, as well as my dad also helped as well. Yeah. Do you mind sharing what's happened today, Ryan? Yeah, well, one of my carers decided, so I had a mass like gathering because of the coronavirus in the, in the garden with my family and there was like 30 of us and the carer, the night carer decided to take a day, a night off without my permission. So I had to speak to the agency and get it all sorted. So now I've got one of my old carers coming back to cover this person who did night shift. Yeah. That takes some confidence to um, be quite assertive to deal with um, issues with staff. Do you think yeah. you were that confident? No, I think that comes from my dad. Because my dad was always, he was always, you have to persevere with these things. And he taught me perseverance and uh, always trying to look other ways of getting around problems. So he taught me problem solving as well. The, like, the, like I've told you in the past, at like, the time I wanted to go out to these, um, it was in the Southwest France and it was these houses on stilts. And my dad thought, I thought, oh, I was never gonna get on this, this uh, the boat because the jetty was like, maybe 70 degrees incline or something like that. So I was in the manual wheelchair and my dad said to the, the captain, can you tie a rope to my wheelchair? And then lowered me down into the boat. And that's how we got on. But annoyingly, the tide was in, so we couldn't actually go very, without, so we couldn't go very far, but still, we still got to see the houses on stilts. Thank you. Actually, now I think that was a big memory for my dad. So he actually, he, well, as some of you know, my dad's not around anymore. And he wanted his ashes scattered there because of that memory. Yeah. Yeah. Is that yet to do? Have you managed to do that, Ryan? That's yet to do because of coronavirus. But yeah. I'm sure you'll manage it though. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and the last question I want to ask just now is of John Ashby. We've got yeah. two. <laughs> um, when I was chatting to you um, before the event, something I was asking about was I know that you went on a trip with somebody that I know to Centre Parks for a holiday away. And I'd asked you about that and how similar to Mark, how difficult it is to organise and all the things that you need to be able to do to organize a trip to the center parks and you pretty much said it was quite easy there was everything there and you just had to hire a hoist and made it sound incredibly easy <laughs> and i said to, and I, <laughs> I asked you who gave you that confidence and i was expecting you to tell me that it was your parents and you told me it was somebody different do you want to share that with us i was a friend of mine called christina she's an heavy confidence and how did she give you that how did she give you that confidence John just by saying like you can do it just do it 
just do it. You can do anything. He said. So I used to be quite, quite shy, but nowadays I'm very different. A bit more confident, I think. So for those people that don't know who Christina is, Christina has a neuromuscular condition as yeah. well, doesn't she? Yeah. And she was going away and wanted you to go on holiday with her. Yeah, no, was... no, we did. And we did. <laughs> the the photos are amazing. And I've got lots of photos. There's some good memories from that as well. Thank you. Yasmin, do you want to, to ask questions of um, John now? Yes, John Hasty. Um, oh. Right well, I thought no. the last no. question, no. question to ask you might be, you know, you're someone who has achieved a lot in your life. So tell me about maybe one of your proudest achievements. And it could be a big thing or it could be a little thing. But something Ooh. that comes to mind. Um, well, I, I might have said the PhD before, but actually I think... Um, I feel like creating Pathfinders is probably uh, like the thing that I'm most proud of. Like you know, me and me and Mark and uh, Robert Watson at the at the time kind of coming together and uh, yeah, creating this and kind of like building it into something more really. So I think um, you know, seeing other people like coming into Pathfinders and kind of like making it their own, do, leading on other projects and kind of, you know, it was never about me doing something for myself. It was always about trying to do something for the community and bring people in. So just seeing, like, uh, you know, the team that we've got now, I, I would say that's the proudest the thing I'm most proud of. And, um, you know, again, thinking back to, it's not something that just happened overnight mm. and it took something from you. You you know, something, a skill, a resource, a quality from you to to sort of help make this happen and support it and see the development. So, you know, if you think about what, what are the sort of skills and qualities that you think you've developed over time that made it possible for you when the opportunity came or you made the opportunity when you started? Yeah, so I, I think doing the PhD really built a lot of skills. Um, because like you do um, a degree and then a master's and it's quite structured learning. Um, you know, it's um, very much you've got like assignments and exams that you've got to complete. It's quite directed and you know what you've got to do and when. Um, with a PhD, it's much more open in terms of, you know, you've got to come up with the idea of something you want to research and then you've got to go out and do the research you basically got to see this project through from uh start to completion and that like it's unstructured so you know you get some guidance and support but actually you you learn how to uh create and, and see through a project and i think that kind of gave you that that confidence and that skill to you know to think about what do you do when somebody isn't telling you what to do um and kind of you know, to take that initiative and, and to think, actually, this is what I want to do, and then being able to break that down into, like, piece by piece, step by step, how do I, you know, get, get from here to there kind of thing. So I think um, it's definitely the PhD, because that gave me the confidence then to think, like, you know, travelling away to um, to New York to do a big, like, America trip, um, which took a lot of planning. I, you know, I wouldn't have thought about that unless... I'd had that, that experience of, of running a project and uh, you know, everything else in my life is kind of taken on a similar like a similar approach really I've come up with an idea and then I've thought about how to make that happen basically so I think it's it's that planning, that logistics as Bart was yeah. saying but it's also that, that initiative and that willingness to think like okay no one's telling me what to do or no one's helping me here but I know this is what I want to achieve and being able to kind of like just you, you know take that forward really but um, you know I've had a lot of support along the way it's not just gonna uh, me being able to do this I'm just you know off the cuff by myself yeah 
So lovely words there, initiative, confidence, planning, logistics, which I think is a really great word because it's involved an awful lot of things. And being able to break things down into small steps. So you yes. can't handle it all, but taking it step by step, which is a bit how you sort of built up Pathfinders, wasn't it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You know, we started off as a Facebook group first. It was, you know, just quite a simple thing, really. And so, again, you know, when you were younger, if you think back now, um, I mean, obviously you wouldn't have known at the time, but can you think of a, a couple of things that you you did or your parents encouraged you to do or a couple of experiences you had when you were younger that really mm. helped to build the, the possibility for doing the things that you have done and achieved? Um, I mean, I think uh, going to university, and I can relate to what other people have said about like my parents not really treating me any differently from my from my brother who is non-disabled and uh you know just uh so i could expect to have the same uh opportunities obviously that you know they provided extra support to make um uh, to make that happen but in terms of like um the expectations they you know it was largely the same to begin with but i, I think um probably it was kind of like my parents pushing me to do more uh certainly in the beginning um and i think kind of as things have got a lot of gained more skills and confidence i kind of taken over that that role and then i'm pushing things and kind of like mm -hmm. pushing beyond what they expected but to begin with it was kind of like they uh, they were pushing me more i think and uh you know just just to think about what i wanted and uh, what i wanted to achieve i know when i went to university my mum kind of played a very big role in sorting out the care and the you know, helping me to go visit the university. So I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't get as involved anywhere near as much as like I would do, you know, at, at my age now. But yeah, it was that, that kind of pushing me, I think, and not, not letting me off the hook as well. Because, you know, my mum did a lot of, like, help me with a lot of the admin that you get as a disabled person. And gosh, there is a lot of admin. Um, but yeah, you know, my mum used to do like kind of everything, but you know, she was like, as I got older, she was like, you know, it's time you start, you know, doing some of this stuff for yourself and kind of like, you know, so sometimes you do need to be a bit pushy and it's like, I'm not going to do this for you anymore. So I kind of, you, you need to, you know, just take care of it yourself. And I think, um, you know, just bit by bit, taking on more responsibility for more things um, was kind of, I think that was quite important in, you know, allowing me to become uh, more independent, really. It's interesting, the step-by-step -step bit, because that's that's a real trademark of the way you do things now. And it sounds like your mum did, like, seeded over slowly the admin bits to you. Yes. Yeah? And and she had to be a bit tough at times, you Yeah, I, I, I think so. That's kind of, it's so tempting to be lazy, particularly when you've got someone doing everything else for you i mean who really wants to do paperwork like yeah. can you've got someone offering to do it for you you're gonna you're, you're gonna let them and i i think that's that's true of many things like you know if if your parents are kind of um you know doing things for you speaking on your behalf it's just easier and kind of like more comfortable for you to to let them do it and um particularly for me as an introvert i, I wasn't very confident i talking to other people that's a skill i've had to learn it's not something i was uh bored with so um you know it's you know the temptation is just to kind of like hide away and not really put yourself forward kind of thing so it's uh yeah taking some work to get there i think mm. i love your honesty about it's really easy to be lazy particularly around mm -hmm. things that are a bit sort of arduous to do yes mm -hmm. i suppose one final question is how did your mum judge when to step in and when to step out a little bit? Because that's quite a hard line to tread as a parent, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, I don't think there's any easy answers to that. And I don't, you know, I don't think she necessarily always got it right. Um, like, you know, maybe I could have been pushed a bit more in certain areas, but like, you know, it's really easy to say that in retrospect, isn't it? But um, so maybe, you know, um i i think we i think we did it quite well but you kind of just got to like figure it out as you you mm. go along really and you've got to tailor it to young uh the the young person as well in terms of what they're 
their skills are. I, I just think it's just like a gradual thing of yeah. bit by bit, step by step, and just a little bit more. So whatever level they're at, um, like right now, it's like, can you push them to be a little bit more um, independent or kind of like advocating themselves just, to, yeah. you know, a little bit, a little bit of time, depending on where people are at, really. Right. It's a bit of trial and error, and a bit yes, of I think so. Be prepared to gaff, I think. Exactly, you're you're never going to get it right all the time, and I think if you you're looking for like this perfect route map to supporting a young person, it just doesn't exist, and it's uh, you just got to figure it out and deal with the challenges as they come along. You know, I you know my parents kind of had, like they drove me to the pub when I went out to the pub with my friends where you know there were times when I would you know drink too much and make myself ill and kind of you know go through that whole part of growing up and you know I've definitely got into arguments with my parents and kind of got grounded a few times and um but they you know they carried on kind of like empowering my independence so you know, it's certainly not been there uh, you know plain sailing all the way kind of always gonna get right kind of thing yeah Thank you, John. Very inspiring. Um, okay, Kath, are we going to, is that, is it time for people to ask their own questions now? I think it is. I think it is. Have we got somebody who wants to ask the first question? If not me and Yasmin are going to have to ask him, John, you see, so we want you to ask the questions. I've got a question, but I've got quite a few questions. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I don't know what to plug it. So first question I'll go in order. Mark, what was the favourite place that you've been to? And also what was the sort of worst place you've been to? Hey, I've got a favourite place in Spain. Um, I've actually been twice. Whereabouts in Spain? Um, it's some sort of small... A hotel in the mountains near Malaga. A called the Pen the Pedras. Uh, the specialising holidays for disabled people. Uh, but the people that run it are fantastic. Very open minded. They're not, they're not pitying of disability or. Anything and they provide really great holidays. They have excursions and great food and all sorts. That's my favourite place. Sounds good. We need some sunshine. <laughs> the pool with the hoist. The pool with the hoist, and then they've got a jacuzzi that you can access. So. Mm. It's a good setup. I believe you shared that link with us before, Mark. So maybe at the end, you'll post it again for people that were interested. And then for Steve, I mean, my personal situation is I've got um, a 13 year old son with Deshaun, and I recently realised he'd never crossed a road on his own before, and he'd never actually been into a shop on his own before. So my big thing over Easter was to try and start making him, you know, cross a road on his own and make him go into shops because he's always with me. He never leaves my side. And just, you know, what, at what point did you, you know, start doing things more independently? And when did you start to introduce carers outside of the family? Because at the minute, a lot of the care that Jack has is provided by me and his grandparents. Yeah, well, I was the local when I first got my own carers. And it's kind of what I'm going to say. Um, it takes a lot of time to get used to the carers. And um, I basically got my confidence when I used to play out with my uh, brother's friends. And 
that's when I started to go to traps and gave stuff. And it just took a while. How old were you, Steve, when you started to, to go to the shops with your friends? I was about, I think we were about nine when I first started. And um, started to use a wheelchair. And once I got my wheelchair, because you know, come to the stage where you start falling over and hurting yourself. And once I got the wheelchair, that made me go and do stuff. So for you, the transition to a wheelchair was actually a positive step, independence-wise? Is that yeah. what you're saying? And when about when did you start using your having carers from outside of the family home? Was that after you came back from residential college? No, that was I was eleven. Okay. So primary school, start of high school. And was that a small amount of time to start with, Steve? Um, Lee was telling us at the last event that that he found that again from the age of 11 that it was just a few hours that he would use social care to go along to some of his um, clubs that he would have been going to on his own rather than having his mum taking him. Yeah that's what I got to start with and then went through agency and then to a health country. Thank you. Kath I have I have a question. Um, I really enjoyed the conversation uh, thus far. There's some interesting, the language of transition um, when, when young adults and adults talk about um, transition, this word resilience crops up time and time again. And I, I had the pleasure of chatting to Suzanne earlier and learning more about her PhD on resilience and emotional intelligence. And we were, we were beginning to explore, but the hour flew by, didn't it, Suzanne? So we'll talk again, I'm sure. But I have a particular interest in what sits behind this word resilience. So my question is, is really directed at, at Ryan, at, um, at Mark and, and John, and also to Steve. In, in a nutshell, Chats, what does, what does resilience mean to you? Who wants to go first? It's having, having a certain strength. Um, a certain strength to push forward, I suppose. Um, yeah, I, th I think for me it's kind of um, it's being adaptable, uh, being willing to uh, try different approaches and to uh, uh, willingness to to change. I think it's like like if you think about you know when Duchenne progresses or when you notice that you've lost the ability to to do something, it's kind of like how how do you move forward from that point? Like do you get stuck on that, or how can you kind of move forward? So I think it's it's that being able to uh, adapt and change and continue to go forward and not kind of get stuck really um so i guess now you know when i do lose something i'm much more thinking about like okay, how do i solve this problem practically like you know what other options are there um you know what technology exists to kind of overcome this uh this barrier rather than kind of like dwelling on the loss of, of you know you know what i've lost it's more about okay what what do i do next it's kind of like what can i what can i do differently and uh, yeah, just being able to continually move forward, I think. There's an interesting perspective. There are a number of different definitions. I know that psychologists um, de de um, define resilience as like, you know, the process of adapting well, which you've just spoken about, John, but adapting well 
in the face of adversity. And so, you know, that pushing forwards thing is an interesting observation that Mark has just mentioned. Being able to adapt as a result of perhaps no longer being able to do X, so you think about doing it in a different way, so you, you, you discover why. Um, Ryan, what, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, mine's about sort of never giving up, really. And always I try to, I try to think there's always someone worse than me. So I know that I need to find a way of adapting and changing things to be able to do things. And sometimes I think that it also, if you know someone that's worse than you, if you find a way of doing it, you can tell them how you did it. And then that will give, and then it like becomes like a, Chain reaction to it. Yeah. No, that's a great answer. Can I just make, can I come in there as a parent, having been through it all? I think as parents we have to be resilient as well. I'm thinking of Alex about to start this whole new section with with Jack. And when we get our boys and they're diagnosed, our reaction is to just go into like, oh my goodness, my child's not going to be the person we thought. We can't think outside the box to begin with. We think yeah. we've got this perfect child that's going to achieve and blah, blah, blah. It takes a lot of resilience and strength and working through to realise that actually our boys can go on and get PhDs if that's what they want to do, or they can get married or go to university. So there's a lot of resilience needed for parents because we have to unpick it. And then for a long time, we look after them when they're young because we have to be there then we have to start letting go and we have to be resilient to let someone else come in and do that care to let them be independent so i get exactly what john was saying about the the arguments with mum and dad as to when to let go and when to not step in because for us our overarching thing would be to molly cuddle our boys and do it all for them because that's what we've done for years and years but we've got to unpick it all again and let them be normal teenagers let them get drunk and be ill you know have the girlfriends and it goes wrong all that sort of thing so I think for us it's just as much of resilience as well um and and a learning curve for us as well so um <laughs> I just thought I'd put our, our side in as well <laughs> no, no, that's a great it's a great 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 observation it was Suzanne you mentioned to me this morning we were chatting you said resilience is a team effort um, which is which is interesting, and I'm sure we can explore that further. But um, Steve, I'd, Steve, I'd really appreciate your insight just on that point. Yeah, the ability to find for what you need, and Steve, I was I was really interested, but I think this might um, actually help illustrate this point. I was really interested to hear that. When I asked what you've been up to before the weekend, you told me that you'd been in a, a, a sports car. Yeah, it's a charity race car. And I went around a few laps. Wasn't there a lot of planning involved into to being able to do that? Uh, no, not really. It's just uh, just finding a race to get in the car. And it's all done by a charity. With the I think what's interesting to hear with you, Steve, is that I think you're completely you have a completely different uh, makeup to John. I know that John likes things to be really well planned and there be a real structure. But talking to you, Steve, I, I get the feeling that I think a lot of things are done with it. It'll be fine. We'll just yeah. do this. <laughs> I think Steve is confusing uh, resilience with revs. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm a <laughs> What about John? John, uh, John Ashby, do you, do you have a perspective on resilience? Well, just fighting, really. Fighting for survival. Sort of thing, isn't it? Like an animal, like, it's been like we all got that instinct to be resilient. And we have to be. So, through our lives, we practice being resilient and be fighting for the things we need. 
Yeah. One of my favourite memories with John, and I don't know if John will remember this, um, and I think it's what you guys all develop, this, this way of coping if something slightly goes wrong. And I can remember being on a train coming back from a conference. I don't know if you remember this, John. And our trains were, they'd all gone pear-shaped and nothing was meeting and we were trying to work out what station we could go to. I got into complete meltdown thinking I'm never going to get to King's Cross or wherever it was. John had it all planned. He had it on his phone. He was so laid back. It was incredible. And when we got off in London, there he was. I, I can remember to this day running with him because he got it so planned with his care of which way we were going and which lift we needed and what platform we needed. And I was just in meltdown. So I think you guys get, get this inbuilt sense of, well, you, it might not go quite right, but because you have to plan everything, you've also got you, you've got that coping mechanism in a way. And I was absolutely gobsmacked with that. And um, I wouldn't have got in the right place on the right train for people. <laughs> <Yeah. on. laughs> I, I, I think that comes from experience of um, trains always seeming to go wrong and you always have to kind of find a, a you know, a second solution. Uh, but I would, I would say, you know, I haven't always been like that. I thought, I was terrified to use a train to begin with. And it was kind of Thomas that really, my partner, who really encouraged me to like start using trains. Well, I, you know, I definitely had uh, situations at the beginning where it went wrong, and I was just kind of like, you know, just start to freak out a little bit. But then you kind of, you've just got to find a way way to do it. But I think you know the reason I've become able to manage that and deal with that situation is because I've been. Uh, exposed to it and dealt with it and kind of like had to solve the problem and then yeah. you see that actually you can you can find a solution and that gives you that uh confidence. like uh, yeah confidence and that ability to cope with that situation again so yeah it, you know it didn't come naturally to me i learned kind of how to do that really and it, to begin with it's quite quite difficult i think john john you'll you'll notice that you 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 know you learn through experience of doing something right so with alex yeah. and, and your son the, the idea of crossing a road or going to a shop when your son has done that, if he hasn't done it already, um, that's going to, you know, broaden his perspective and enrich his sense of seeing the world in a slightly different way by crossing that road and by going into that shop and all the experiences that come from that moment in time when he crosses a road or goes into a shop. But it could be quite scary to begin with. Uh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's always worth saying that. But sometimes you just got to you got to push, right, push yeah, them yeah. out, push them out the nest, I suppose. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's no different from an, an able-bodied person, is it? Uh, no. We've got to realise that as parents, I think. Yeah. yeah, it's just sometimes you have less opportunities to practice and yeah. try things. So you've got to, you've got to engineer those, those opportunities where for other people they would just happen kind of naturally. Organically, yeah. I think I'd like, I think I'd like to add, John, that, um, I know that you're saying that you, you might have less opportunities and so they've got to be engineered but also what you do have more of is you have more opportunity to learn about resilience from all the people that are around you dealing with that yeah. so you pick up I think that the reason that you all are, are much more resilient is because you've picked that up from your parents from other people yeah. who supported you and from the experiences that you've had so it works that works in the other way yeah I think a big part of it is having something to live for as well like you know I can't yeah. afford to get yeah. bog, bogged down in stuff because I've yeah. I've got too much I want to do, and you know having that having that drive is really important. Whatever that means to you, it means different things to different people. But for me, you know, uh, the, the work that I do and other things that I'm involved with, you know, that 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 keeps me going really. Yeah, yeah but John, you see, there's a magic thing right there that you've just said, um, which is you have purpose. All yeah. right. If, if there are young people that haven't perhaps yet discovered what their purpose is um, as they're going through and transitioning through into adulthood, it's having that support network around you, having people who believe in you and encourage you, um, but your own, you know, your own drive and your own sense of self. It's, it's just interesting. You know, we've words like perseverance that Ryan mentioned, and he got that attribute through his, through his father. And, and I've known his father for many, many years. And, you know, I could see that attribute in his dad and I can see that attribute absolutely uh, in Ryan. Um, but he has that support network around him. So I'm thoughtful about those that perhaps don't have that support mechanism around them and how they can take practical steps to perhaps be a little bit more tenacious in their thought process or a little bit more resilient or pushy 
um, or have a bit more gumption, a little bit more fortitude in, in how, they, how they kind of live their day-to-day -day lives. And we talk about the virtue of patience. And as someone that who's, you know, I have muscular dystrophy, as some of you will know, I'm sure many of you do, um, limb girdle muscular dystrophy, type 2A, 2A on chromosome 15. And I've noticed my levels of deterioration and my levels of energy and are, are deteriorating. It's slow, it's progressive, but but that that virtue of patience is um, just so incredibly important, I think, in in terms of uh, transitioning and therefore talking about the virtue of patience is really important. And so it was just it was lovely to hear Ryan talk about, you know, his father and talk about perseverance, because boy oh boy, you know, so 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 many families who who just persevere day after day after day, you know, and it's, it's, it's not easy. Michael, I'd just like to pick up on something you said that was about um, what do, do families do who maybe don't have that support or that confidence to pass on to their young people. And I actually broached on this with Steve, but I think it's relevant with to Ryan as well. And I asked Steve and he thought it was important because I know that he is part of the Power Joe football community. Um, and he plays Pouchy Football for Leeds, and there are a number of younger people with Duchenne that are part of his team as well. And I want—I just wanted to know really what, what Ryan and Steve both thought about what they brought to that community, to those younger people who had Duchenne. Ryan, do you have something you want to add? Yeah, so I think also Toulouse is a big part I'm sure Steve would agree, even though we ridicule it a lot. To the Lord's taught us a lot of things because we had many friends in that same situation every day. And like Steve said earlier, we didn't really plan things. We just went out with our friends. Uh, we got on a train and went to London to run a place of our. But with uh, wheelchair football, I think it was just knowing that so it's a sport that children around the world play every day. And it, we just get to be sort of, first of all, normal children, but then adults to be able to play the game that everyone loves around the world. But we do it in wheelchairs and that's the only difference. So, yeah. Thank you. Is there anything you want to add, Steve? And yeah, I've heard. I'm going to make much a quick thing. About crossing the road, I was in school. I went to a residential school and we had a, a trip into the town centre and we were waiting to cross the green line at the road. And there was absolutely nothing coming. And I just whizzed across on my own. And I got a row for doing that. <laughs> but yeah, that shows you when I was even young, I would All right, I can just go my own way. <laughs> <laughs> As long as you don't do a Dan, he used to think because he was in a wheelchair, he could go in the road and the cars would automatically stop because <laughs> he was in a wheelchair. We had a few near misses with that one. Um, has anybody got any questions before we just finish up? Brilliant. Well, thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, the intention is following on from this event that and this is where Philip's comment from earlier comes in, that we're hoping that um, we're going to repeat the event in about a month. It um, will be after the date soon, but the next one will be Ask the Parents. And following, yeah. from, following on from that, we'll have Ask the Millennials, really difficult to say. Um, so there'll be some young people. So the next event will be about Asking the Parents, so a very similar format which is where it comes where you um jumped in philip earlier and i was thinking oh that's perfect um i must remember that she's spoken there so that that's the plan is that we're going to do this again um but with parents rather than adults everybody's welcome again but the plan will be that we'll do it again in about a month 
Oh, I, think... I mean, I've just volunteered myself for something. <laughs> Possibly. <Yeah. laughs> been really well, well done, Kath. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's been really great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thanks for all the speakers as well. Thank you, Ryan, John, John, yeah. Stephen, Mark. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Anytime. Thanks, everybody. No problem, Kath. Anytime, anytime. Enjoy your evening. And you too. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.